Oh, no. Do you have that with you? No. Just wait until 1 okay. or 12.30, though. Okay. Um, we might not even get to the questions. And I took some out after I got Diane's slides because I think that that's great. So if we just talk about the slides, that's fine. But I, I definitely do want to, um, even if it's in between the slides, just to get into a little bit about the before and after about what you've been doing, Dale, and sort of where your mind's at with that. So that's where some of the questions are going. And I uh, just wanted to check with you all. Um, I, I, I mean, affirmative action is something that's constantly changing and always on the agenda in South Africa. Is it something, and I put it as one of the questions, but I don't know if we really want to touch on it today. Um, you want to leave affirmative action out? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll be honest, Elric, I think that uh, given the complexities of what's going on in the U.S. right now, it is uh, less of a legal uh, legal discussion and more of a, my concept is it's more of a, uh, uh, like a humanistic approach and uh, increasing awareness um, on some of the things that have been happening here and some of the things that I know, at, me as a white person, I get a whole bunch of stuff from white people that I'm like, really? And so, you know, it's, yeah, it's some of that complexity of like the sociology behind it and the, you know, the history mm -hmm. and the slides are really kind of meant to like pull us along to, to look at, you know, discrimination and what it means globally and then how it, what's going on in the United States and elsewhere in the world in relation to it, you know? So okay. That well, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then we go with that. And then the idea is we're just focusing on America today, which I'll tell everybody. And then from there, if, if there's interest, they must let us know. And then we will find speakers and get speakers for a session with South Africa and also with the UK if, if they want to have a further discussion. But today is just a general discussion and it's focusing on both of your views and perspectives of what's going on in the US. So I'll just act as, as the interviewer today. Okay. And maybe drop one or two comments about South Africa, but I don't want to take it. We'll just keep keep it on YouTube today. Okay. Is that fine, DL? Are you muted? I think it would just flow predominantly from Diane's presentation, and we can add some uh, commentary, you know, inter, inter, interweaving in, in that. Okay. Now, if I'm cool. sharing, okay. I can't see any of the, with sharing the screen, I can't see any of the stats for, uh, for Zoom. You should still be able to scroll or just move your um, mouse and get the bar that comes over and be able to click on it. Right. Toolbar. For anyone just joining us, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Just bear with us. Waiting for attendees. Thank you. You know, I had to say, guys, while we're waiting for everybody to join, I was thinking this morning as I was taking a shower and washing my hair, you know, it's really super unfair that the both. Uh, I've lost. I've lo uh, your hair is not wet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, I lost the middle part, but I heard you said something about the hair being wet and, and we don't have hair. Just can you give us, give me the criticism again one more time. Right. So this I morning you. I was taking a shower and I had a, I had a yeah. plan ahead because, you know, you have to take the shower and then you have to get your hair dry yeah. and, you know, do all that. And I decided I wasn't going to style it. I was just going to clip it up. But <laughs> I thought of the two of you and I thought how unfair it is that you could, that all of this, uh, all of these thoughts uh, need not be in your mind because you don't have to worry about what you're going to do with your hair. You That's true, but you know what we, yeah. 
That's fine. But what we do have, especially, I see DL's managing it well today, but I've got the shine of the sun on my forehead. It's reflecting on all of y'all. And I can't do anything about that right now. In the hotel room, the light is the light. And so I would like a bit of hair right now to hide this shine going on here. So everybody's got their demons they have to deal with here. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, it does kind of lead into the uh, different people's perspectives and, um, and and how discrimination and racism come into play, so. Right. Right. Hey, listen, Diane, again, don't rush um, this presentation. If we just, if we just, uh, if we stop and talk about a point here and there, and that's all we get through, and then we take questions. I think yeah. DL, he's nodding. That's really fine, so. been so long that I forgot where the mute button was for a second. I, I don't know. In Japan, they use a different app. And in South Africa, they were using Zoom, but then they stopped using Zoom because someone spoke about how um, it wasn't so safe anymore. And so, yeah, what's happening with you? Are you all using Zoom in, in your other companies still? Or have you migrated to something else? Yeah, we're, I mean, uh, we're using Zoom. Uh, the news that had come out was that there were security breaches and that mm. Zoom had, uh, had, had uh, programmed patches to try to uh, reduce that and increase its security. So mm. I'm, I'm always surprised though when doctors want to have Zoom visits because um, according to certain regulations under HIPAA, uh, Zoom doesn't meet the criteria for confidentiality. So, um, that's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I, we already heard the, this is recording and I see it is recording, but Tiffany, are we still waiting? It's 1231. You can, uh, you can start if you'd like. It's recording. So uh, are, we still, are, we, are we still waiting for some attendees to join or what should uh, we do? We can wait another minute or two? You can wait another minute if you'd like. It's up to okay. you. Okay. Start as, whenever you'd like. Thanks. Hello to everyone who's already joined. We're just going to wait one or two more minutes and then we'll get started. So... I'm not sitting here in Japan, finally made it through to Japan, no longer South Africa. But that was quite a ordeal as well. Yeah. And it looks like you got out just in time as well, because, uh, right. you know, the spread of COVID is um, just not slowing down. No, it's, it's now in the top 10, South Africa. I think it's about to catch up with Mexico, yeah. uh, which has really shot up really fast. Uh, and on Sunday night, the president imposed an immediate uh, further restrictions. Here it comes again, Diane, but alcohol has been banned again oh. immediately. <laughs> but seriously. So I, 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 I sent a shot of my whiskey to um, the South Africans and said, I'm thinking of you. But, but that was immediate. The uh, alcohol, uh, the cases are in the hospitals from alcohol abuse was just too much. So they... Um, they need the beds for COVID now, so they've pulled alcohol, uh, and and then um, also they instituted another curfew. I think from nine until four in the morning, mm. so it's gone a bit backwards again. And we already had one of the res the most restrictive uh, lockdowns in the world, I think. So it's been devastating for the economy, but it's a balance between that and lives. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall we get going? Thank you everybody for joining today. And this session of yes. breathing together was already postponed <laughs> twice. And uh, thank you for hanging in there for those who registered two sessions ago or when it was supposed to originally come on. And uh, with, with all of the changes and difficult mm -hmm. times that we've been having, uh, with Corona in different parts of the world, uh, and I being in South Africa, now I finally made it back to Japan, which was a five-day flight instead of a 
20 hour flight. I wasn't flying for all of that time, but I was stuck in Ethiopia for three days without internet and because they had political unrest in the country and I had armed guards around the hotel. And just the, that was one of the reasons why it got postponed at one stage, but they, we've just had a few issues. And um, so today what we are not going to do is we're not going to do a complete breathing together of UK, South Africa and America. I don't think there's enough time to discuss all of them and we couldn't get all of those speakers together, but we didn't want to postpone once again. So what we are going to do today is we're going to focus on America, what's happening with Black Lives Matter there, and also just discuss about how we all can breathe in this together and how we can't breathe and can't deal with this discrimination any longer. And I might throw in one or two comments from a South African perspective, but primarily I will be asking questions and listening to the immediate past chair of the section, Diane O'Connell, and also D.L. Morris, who's the co-chair of the South African chapter, and I'm the other co-chair. So the discussion will just be between the three of us today, and please drop us comments and questions. We'll try to get to them at the end. And if you are interested in what we are discussing today and would like us to still do one where we bring in other countries, one with uh, UK and South Africa and more attorneys from those, those countries and maybe expand it even further, if it continues to be a success, then please let us know in the comments because we do want to give you what you want. So um, I'm gonna kick this off by, by uh, just asking Diane to run us through some presentations well, let me, let me presentation jump in rather a quick oh, deal. and uh just yeah. to add the note that you know this this really is not going to be a comprehensive discussion on all of the recent events that have gone on certainly on the u.s side you know i i think this is intended to really just be a part one as we continue to explore our role Absolutely. in in looking at what uh recent events have have certainly showed as issues of racial unrest and dispute that are that are yeah. still not solved that are still very relevant so uh diane i suppose we should say thank you so much for um so much of the work that you certainly put in 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 this presentation that we're going to continue to have on what is discrimination and what that looks like on a global mm -hmm. perspective so yeah, with that you. i'll turn it over to uh the esteemed past chair and and still always my president uh, diane <laughs> yeah yeah Thank you. I'm going to run for president of the United States one day. Um, probably not. We both nodded. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, in, in, in trying to figure out how to set this up, it, it, it's a complex issue. It's a complex issue. And, and as part of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which both DL and I are for the international section, trying to come up with a diversity policy, which when NISBA came up with one, uh, started to discuss uh, kind of what I like to call quotas, uh, which always kind of bug me, but I guess they're necessary to, to, to get an accomplished goal um, and increase the perspective. But the question for the international section is what's discrimination? What is diversity? What's inclusion on a, on a global uh, arena? It's not black and white. It's not uh, Mexico and American. It's not, you know, it, it's a little bit more complex because each region has its own issues. So I put together a couple of stats, which I'm not gonna belabor getting into, uh, but just do an overview and we'll circulate the slides later. And there's some references at the end if you wanna do further research. Um, but just to start out, if you, you wanna try to come up with a, a concept on what discrimination is, um, which is the root of racism and, and sexism and any kind of uh, treating another person as if they're not equal to the others. Uh, Amnesty International had a pretty good definition. Um, it's basically when a person's unable to enjoy his or her human rights or other legal rights on an equal basis. Uh, and it further got, I further went in and I saw United Nations has, has an entire initiative whereby all the countries in the United Nations are supposed to adhere to these principles, which are all amazing. And I read them and my heart warmed up and it started to grow. And I said, oh, wow, you know, on a global arena, we have the same concept on how people should be treated. It should be equal. It's an economic issue. Um, it's a, an issue to, to decrease corruption, decrease poverty. And so I was really excited about it. And, and, and in a in a small box it sounds fantastic but when you start getting into the realities of what really goes on in the world i said well 
since these principles have been put in place, what progress has there been? Is there, uh, is there a, uh, an improvement? And it seems like there's an improvement in extreme poverty across the world um, from some of these initiatives, but ultimately the change has not moved in a direction that it needs to. And that includes in the US. So I included a few different definitions of, or types of discrimination, um, you know, just, just to keep it in context because it does get muddy and it does get confusing you know, well, there's laws that protect people. Yeah, there's laws that protect people, but there's also those laws are drafted from one perspective and may indirectly discriminate against somebody else because they didn't consider their position. There's the obvious direct discrimination. Then there's the intersectional discrimination. So go through some of these and, and start to absorb it and, and uh, hear for yourselves in your own voice, what these types of discriminations are and apply them to things that you know. Um, so in going through, if you look, even though the UN has put in place principles about discrimination and equal rights for human beings across the world, 76 countries still criminalize sexual acts between adults of the same sex. 10 of those countries are punishable by death penalty. 30 countries still practice genital mutilation, even though it's illegal. Femicide is still prevalent in, in South America, and as well as in India is one of the top five countries. Um, so, so, sorry, uh, Diane, before yeah. we proceed with the progress, can we take it back two slides and just actually go over briefly those discriminations, the, the different types? I think it will be important for the topics and questions we get into a bit later. So let's okay. maybe run through them. Absolutely. So, I mean, it, direct discrimination is basically what we understand to be racism. Um, it's an explicit distinction made between groups and no matter what that group is. So, I mean, in Australia, it was Aboriginals back in the early 1900s. It was Maoris in New Zealand. It was uh, Catholics in the Philippines. It was um, Muslims in Myanmar. I mean, you, 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 the list goes on and on and on and on on a global basis on what dis direct discrimination is. Here in the United States, it seems to be anything that's not white Christian. Um, there is discrimination. And ultimately, the direct discrimination generally is uh, targeted towards the minority population in a specific society. And that's the easy one. The indirect discrimination is the one where, like I had said, there's laws that are passed, but they're passed in a way in which maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, end up disproportionately disadvantaging other human beings in that particular society because they're drafted in a way which makes it impossible for those people to actually adhere with the law. And an example in the US would be uh, voter ID cards. There are some folks in order to, you have to have some form of an identification of photo ID. To get a photo ID in many states in the United States, you have to have uh, a driver's license right, to get a voter ID. To get a driver's license, you have to have a utility bill from the place that you live. You have to have your birth certificate. You have to have proof of residency. You, I mean, there's all these things that you have to have. And now if you go back to one example, after Hurricane Katrina, Anybody who lived in the Ninth Ward that got wiped out, chances are they don't have any ID right after that. It would have taken months to years for them to regroup all that information. And so by creating a, a requirement that people have a photo ID in order to register to vote or in order to go vote actually discriminates against people who are either one too poor to get a driver's license, because like in New York, it costs almost $100. Um, or they, they can't read, they're illiterate, they don't have the documentation, or they don't have the resource to, to actually go get the photo ID to begin with. So that would be a form of indiscriminate, uh, indirect discrimination. Um, the intersectional discrimination, basically what that does is it just combines everything, you know? And so if you look in the US, if you go down south and you try to like start looking at Jim Crow laws and then the voter requirement to have a photo ID, and you start merging those, all that stuff together, that starts to become the intersectional discrimination, which is really what we're seeing in the United States 
on a very high level, in my opinion. So, and I would just I would just add, it's interesting how you know these types of discrimination also seem to follow along the trend of what biases look like, and so you certainly have explicit direct bias, or if you want to put it in the context of racism, you have explicit racism. Somebody says something derogatory towards another group, but you also have implicit bias, or what we are tending to see where folks are not, you know, I'm not racist, that good bad binary that I know Dr. D'Angelo in White Fragility talks about. I'm not racist because I haven't said ABC, but our implicit biases and the fact that we're not being anti-racist, as you'll also hear from some later discussions on Dr. Abram Kendi, um, lend itself to an output, an outcome of this sort of indirect uh, bias or indirect discrimination. Yeah, and just to add in there, that's definitely something that I want to look into, uh, something that in terms of breathing together, I think understanding implicit bias is super helpful and important, but we'll get to that a bit later. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll bounce back forward again. Um, we discussed this a little bit in the Human Rights, De the Human Development Report that came out in 2000, 2017 by the UN. Um, they had found that, that uh, extreme poverty had reduced, but general poverty had not. And ultimately, if you go through the entire report, what it basically says is that by discriminating against a, a certain class of people in a society, that what you do is you, you increase corruption, you decrease transparency, you unempower people, you therefore uh, create a greater income gap between poverty and wealth. And on top of the fact that in doing all of that, it's counterproductive to the economics of any society because if you have such an inequality and a separation, you're not getting innovative perspectives from different angles. So therefore you're looking at things only in one way in a, a, a homogenous uh, approach and you're not addressing the needs of the, 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 the whole. So it's, it's, a, it's an economic counterproductive approach, um, and it's, but it still hasn't, I mean, it's got so far to go. If we ever get there, I don't know, because I think our lizard brains are, um, are, are scheduled to, to just think in the way we think. <laughs> We're trying to get people's intellect to start thinking differently. Um, so, I mean, this is, it, it, discrimination in general is, is, is globally, and it's uniform, no matter what the individual, what the group is that's being discriminated against, whether it's women, whether it's blacks, whether it's Jews or Muslims or, you know, aboriginals or whatever it is, it doesn't make a difference. The, the, the rhetoric is always the same. There's always a demonization. Um, there's always a, 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 a it's a fear-based message. Um, it was the, the most recent one that was uh, dire was in Myanmar. Um, and, and, and it, it I'm going to get speechless because I start getting like wound up about this, but, <laughs> um, the, the rhetoric is the same though. It's finger pointing. It's, it's, uh, it's basically instead of treating people as human beings, you start treating them as groups and classes of people. Um, and, and it's easier to demonize people when they're in a group of anonymous faces that you don't have to look them straight in the eye. Uh, so, I mean, this is how, the, how discrimination and racism and, and, and um, biases are, are, are manifested and how they're, they're fed and how they grow throughout the world is just the rhetoric. So it's, let's be careful about what we say. And let me just add to that point, you know, when you jump in, a lot of the work that I do on a cultural standpoint here at the firm, you know, our Asian Pacific Affinity Group has definitely called a lot of attention to some of the rhetoric around uh, or nomenclature used in correlating uh, COVID to, you know, those uh, Asian Americans and, and just Asians generally. And so, you know, I think that is another example, a more recent example, when you're saying it's the Chinese virus or, or something, you know, there was even some even more egregious language that has certainly been circulated. That is something that folks have to right. be mindful of. Yeah, well, our president's use of uh, Kung flu, I don't think is anything that anybody should be chuckling at. Um, but even if you look at uh, 
the International Labor Organization, I mean, they say that if you discrimination will stifle opportunities and waste human talent needed for economic progress, um, it creates social tensions and inequities. The more tension there is, the less efficient uh, things are operating. You know, you're not working together anymore. It's, if anybody's seen, uh, there's an animation where there's a bunch of very sad, droopy faced people sitting around the edge of a bowl with extremely long spoons. And each one of them tries to dip their spoon into the soup and feed themselves, but the spoon is too long to get them back to their own mouth. So ultimately they're all starving to death until they actually figure out that if they dip the spoon in and feed the person across from them, that person can then do the same thing and feed them. And it's a really good uh, touching animation that shows what happens if you try to do things alone and try to, uh, 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 try to separate people and, and isolate people and what could happen if you actually put them all together. I think it's great things could happen. So we're gonna start getting into the US side of it a little bit, but I got curious about, um, about genocides, like the, the discrimination and bias, how does it impact, how does it impact the world? How does it impact people? And I went through a list and the list goes back to, you know, BC times in the Roman empire, but I figured, you know, let's not bore you with two, two over 2000 years of history. Let's just focus on mo the modern world, 1900 to the present. If you look globally, there's four, there were 48 individual genocides on a, a level that killed more than a hundred thousand people since 1900 took place in 34 different countries and has resulted in the killing of over 42 million people. Now, these genocides were all based on race, religion, uh, political affiliation, had nothing to do with a war necessarily. It was uh, going in, killing, it was like Pol, Pol Pot during the Khmer Rouge, um, it just mass genocide because of one party thinking that the only way they can succeed is to dominate or eliminate the other party. So then if you go into the US, I started looking at, okay, well, there's not really mass genocides on that level, uh, unless you wanna count the Native Americans uh, in the United States, but what has happened in all these stories that I've been seeing on Facebook and in the news and, and books that I've read. And I said, you know, let me try to pull together some of the incidences and the massacres that have happened in the US that targeted people solely because they were black. And the list is on the right. Um, it's resulted in, I don't remember what the count was. Um, I had it in there, but it, it came out, but I, I put the year the incident, the state that it occurred, and the number of deaths in each incident. And, you know, for instance, we'll go back to, uh, I mean, everybody now knows about uh, Greenwood in Tulsa because Donald Trump decided to hold his rally in Tulsa and moved it from June 19th to June 20th. Um, and so it brought up the, the Greenwood uh, massacre in, in Tulsa. I mean, that's a really good example. And there's some of these things like Malaga Island in Maine, that was a completely interracial community of fishermen and existed on the island from the early 1700s all the way through into the early 1900s in complete unity with blacks and whites and intermarrying, no issues at all. And then the governor of Maine decided that it wasn't good for tourism and took most of the people off the island and put all the children into insane asylums to, to get them off the island so that it would, it would look more tourist friendly. So, I mean, these things have been going on for years and, and um, solely because people are black in the United States. So I don't know if there's any, any other folks who are international, um, but when we start getting into the Black Lives Matter uh, subject, there's a few thoughts that I have because we're after this, we're going to start moving into that. Um, and I will say that uh, I have had family members of mine and friends of mine and colleagues of mine who are white and feel like it's okay to say it to me that all lives matter. And 
I've been trying to educate my 82 year old mother on this and it's almost impossible in the fact that I'm going to agree all lives do matter. They do. Absolutely. You're positively right. But that is not a response to the Black Lives Matter. That does not negate the Black Lives Matter movement. Because what you're doing by saying all lives matter is, is you're acknowledging, yes, all lives do matter. But what you're not acknowledging is the fact that for since the beginning of time in the United States, since it's, since it's uh, first people stepped foot here as Europeans and slavery started, that black lives have been treated much differently than white lives and they have not mattered as much as white lives have. And that's what right. the black lives movement is. So, um, Diane, if I can just step in here to pass over to DL quickly, um, sure. this ties in really nicely with uh, implicit bias and in terms of the blue lives matter or all lives matter and also in South Africa, which is a very serious issue happening at the moment. We've got um, a lot of farm mur murders happening and predominantly white farmers that are being murdered. And so a lot of people on Facebook are saying, what about the farm murders? Don't they, don't farmers al also matter? Yeah. And uh, so it's, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, so DL, I don't know if you would like to just add a comment here with regards to implicit bias and how where people genuinely think, some, some of them genuinely think they're helping either the movement or they're helping another movement like the far farmers or, or, or both movements um, where actually it's unhelpful. Yeah, I mean, I think you just look at the historical backdrop here that I think Diane has done a fantastic job of, of outlining and continuing. I mean, certainly on the U.S. side, we also had supporting laws that we mentioned earlier that explicitly, you know, considered a, a black person three-fifths of a person until that was later uh, overruled by, by subsequent Supreme Court decisions. So there's a, there's a deep-seated history here, but I think the colorism is a factor that plays plays itself out across countries and, and even within other groups. I mean, it's not just something unique to black communities, but I, I believe you, you speak with Hispanic Latinos as well and some other groups, the colorism yeah. is a factor that, that um, you know, plays a part in disagreements and, and the discrimination that we're certainly seeing. So I think the broader discussion on all lives versus blue lives versus, versus black lives to Diane's point um, is, is really, detracting from the focus that has most presently been with respect to Black lives uh, and the importance of continuing efforts to advance equity when it comes to opportunities given for Blacks in, in particular. Yeah, and DL, I think that um, in, in looking at this, uh, in looking at this, the, the, as attorneys, and I think most people probably signed on are attorneys, we're taught that we're not supposed to take logical leaps. And so when somebody says Black Lives Matter, you can't say, oh, all lives matter. Because that's like saying John bought a blue house, therefore all blue houses that are owned, they're owned by John. You know, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's trying to do a reverse thing. It's trying to uh, it's trying to uh, perhaps be well-intended and sometimes not, but I think that education and understanding what Black Lives Matter means is a little bit more helpful than just knee-jerk reaction of, you know, all lives matter, you know, because, I mean, I know when my mom says all lives matter, she's just, I mean, she's gonna have a certain level of racism in her just because of where she grew up and who she is and how old she is. Right or wrong, that's the case, you know? I mean, I'm not gonna change her, but then I'll ask her a question like, well, hey, what about your granddaughter? You know, she's black. And she's like, oh, but I don't mean her. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I'm not beating up on my mother, but I have, I have very challenging conversations with her because I will not let her off the hook on it. Um, cause she, she raised me differently than the way she actually behaves. It's a little bizarre. It's like a total, uh, contradiction. But even you get into blue lives matter now. And, and, and that's an, again, another knee jerk reaction. And, uh, you know, there's some Irish, uh, communities in New York city that are predominantly teachers, nurses, firemen, and, and policemen. 
and they're doing a lot of these blue lives matter marches i'm seeing and and people are like well what are you talking about blue lives what are blue lives people what is it for the smurfs because blue lives like people weren't raised like born blue that's a choice they put a uniform on you know they can quit if they don't like it um and so all of this this you know rhetoric that's going on is is really uh, it's distracting and challenging. Um, I've also seen the arguments come through. Well, you know, what about the one-year-old uh, little boy that was killed in the park in bed Brooklyn, this past weekend? You know, why aren't Black Lives Matter protesting for them? And I'm like, but this, so what this is telling me is that uh, people are afraid but they're also more curious than they have been in the past, I think, this is my optimistic side. Um, and I think that they just don't understand the concept of what Black Lives Matter really means and what the mission and the message is. And that's why there's a lot of this knee-jerk stuff because it's, it's knee-jerk stuff to try to make a certain group of people feel more comfortable, fe make them feel like they're less racist, make them feel like they understand more you know, and also applying flawed logic to try to change the rhetoric into like this homogenous, you know, oh no, we're all the same, I see no color concept, which quite frankly, the I see no color concept is a, uh, kind of rubs me the wrong way as well. Oh, that's a whole nother well, microaggression. you spoke about that the microaggression. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. I was just gonna hand it over to you to talk about <laughs> microaggressions. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't want to digress too much, but I mean, you know, to the extent that, you know, folks hold uh, their racial identity and everyone has a racial identity, including whites, um, but that that's a more pronounced identity that they ascribe to, to say that I don't see that, I don't recognize that can be certainly offensive. And, and particularly if the reason you're saying that is because of, of a comfort level um, that the speaker has without regard to really the, the interpretation or receipt of it by those that are receiving it. And so I think a lot of times uh, whites in particular will say, well, I just see everything as colorblind, but I can't live, DL cannot live a colorblind, colorblind existence because everywhere I go and the experience of life that I certainly have had has been shaped by uh, you know, me being a black man and, and the experiences of, and the perceptions of folks around me uh, acknowledging whether explicitly or implicitly that I'm a black man. And so I think the better route is to acknowledge the distinction between us all. And, I, and I've given the analogy of when you buy flowers for your significant other, you intentionally choose a rose versus a tulip versus daisies, daisies or whatever you know, their, their preference is. And I think you're acknowledging that there are a variety of types of flowers. And in the same respect, there's a variety of types of of folks when it comes to our, our racial identities and that's something to be appreciated and celebrated and not something to be dismissed or ignored. Okay, can I just jump in with a question that I think some people, and uh, I don't know if this will be attorneys, but I think it's a, it's a human question that I've heard across the board. So let's forget the people who are just, if we want to call them ignorant or just trying to say they're not racist, let's, let's put those on one side that say all lives matter. What about those hurt people? who are coming from a place of, in the case of a farm murder, murder, their husband has just been murdered brutally, or in the case of uh, the Asian community where they keep on being told in America that they, even though they may be Japanese, uh, that they, from, they are Chinese and they brought the virus over and they must go back home. And they want to also care about Black Lives Matter, but you're dealing with something in between there, hurt, which brings a, a knee-jerk reaction. How, how do we deal with that? I guess I would just say, you know, there's psychological trauma going on all around and, and it's not really an either or proposition, it's a both and. I mean, is it okay that, and I don't know the details and the history behind, you know, the farmer situation, but is that okay? No, you know, uh, and, and in the same respect, is it okay for an officer to sit on the knee of a black man who's unarmed and surrendered to police for eight minutes and 46 seconds, as was the case in May 25th with George Floyd? No, that's not okay. And so I think, you know, you have to embrace both factors. And I, and I guess I would just take a little bit of a tangent in, in respect to a lot of the re reactions around the subsequent 
protests and you know looting and and rioting if you will that also happened and i think dr king has an amazing quote if you look it up on his response to to rioting as it being kind of the response from the unheard but more importantly the that we have to walk finer lines to navigate around the good and bad aspects of all of these situations that is not just this very binary yes good or yes no uh, to the to the full extent, but even in the case of protesting there and, and and or rioting or looting, you've got a multiplicity of factors that are at play behind that, and and whether or not folks are rioting because it's their frustration with the system and it's an output of the system. At the same respect, you probably had a ton of people that were taking advantage of the moment as well. Um, but I think <clears throat> we we do a dis <clears throat> disservice to ourselves when we just put it in the lens or frame it in the lens of an, an either or perspective that uh, it's it, if we're not in agreement with the whole of one one group that is hurting and I think grief is relevant to everyone uh, grief, grief is unique to everyone as, as, as if I might improve that statement and so just acknowledge the grief that everyone has experienced in that in this respect but I think you can also magnify, uh, as Diane has kind of illustrated, the importance or the particular grief right now that's being experienced by uh, Blacks. And, and again, not demonized to the, to the other extent, our police officers, because quite frankly, my personal opinion and some pieces that I've written on, on LinkedIn is, is a lack of, of love and appreciation for Black skin is what we internalize. We internalize our fears around Black people and project that onto uh, what we ask our police officers to do, and that's protect us from the things that we, we're afraid of. So it's it's an important that we don't turn, like I said, to this either or we're going to demonize one group or find excuses for another group, but learn how to accept and embrace the whole and walk the finer lines of right. what's good and bad between them all. Yeah. Right, and, and, and so separate our hurt from the cause, which is obviously difficult for each person, but we've all got that, as you say, individually subjective and, and personal experiences where there's hurt, but separating that from the cause is absolutely a necessary step yeah. but I also in order to see the cause. I think we also have to, in order to be able to do that, in the stages of mourning, and whether it's mourning ignorance or mourning uh, your innocence, uh, mourning what you deem to be your hope, whatever you're mourning, um, mourning the, the, the death of a loved one who's been unjustly killed, uh, you're going to go through the same stages of mourning that everybody goes through. How you manifest that and process that really depends upon whether or not you feel like you're heard and supported. And so while people are being discriminated against and they are feeling hurt or they are feeling fear, it's going to turn into anger and it's naturally going to turn into that. And what's done with that anger is a difference, like could, could take completely different paths and it could take the path of so, such pent up frustration that people end up looting stores, which is what a lot of people are focusing on. Um, or it could manifest itself into uh, an anger in which uh, the motivation going forward is that you're not going to be silenced anymore and that you're going to speak up, but in a peaceful way, a productive way. So it, what makes one person go down one path and the other, I think really depends upon a multitude of things, but I also think it depends upon how much support they're going to get from those around them to continue on a more peaceful, uh, I don't know if I want to say peaceful or not, but a less angry approach, a, a more, in, a, a more, uh, let's just, just like leave it less angry. Let's just, constructive is a good word, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, feel like I, any, any word I'm going to use, I'm like, no, that's not the right word either. That's kind of like, you know, oh, you know, it's productive. Well, what's productive? So yes, constructive is a good, excellent word for the, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So, um, and, and, the, and, and I won't go back, the, the color, the, the, the colorblind thing, uh, I'm just going to say that and I'll move, start moving the slides forward. Um, it, it bugs me because I feel it's a, a little bit of a, a white guilt thing where people are like, oh no, I'm colorblind. I don't see any color. And I'm like, 
and throughout this, it's like a political correctness, like a safety net. The people are afraid to speak out and say that they see color. Like they want to make believe that they treat everybody the same way. And they think that being colorblind uh, comment is what uh, uh, confirms that. And to me, what it actually does is it, it, uh, it, it's kind of hurtful to me because if you're saying that you're colorblind, basically you don't see anybody as being different as what you're telling me. So therefore you must see everybody as if they're the same as you. And so you're going to treat everybody as if how you would want to be treated, but you're not taking into context their own individual creativity, their culture, their religion, or anything else. And so therefore, inadvertently, it's another form of that indirect discrimination where you're trying to treat everybody the same, but it's only treating them the same in the way in which you know how to do it. So I just think that we should, uh, we should cherish the kaleidoscope in which we live in and whether that's the color of your skin, your religion, your gender, your sexual orientation, whether you're an artist or a lawyer, that everybody should be valued for what they bring to the table as an individual. Um, and, and let's move away from the colorblind because I actually like the colors that I see. So uh, I'll move it forward with that. <laughs> and, and that's just a great point that you're also leading into what good allyship looks like. You know, to be a member of another group, but to be an active proponent for advancement and, and support for other groups. Yeah. Um, and I will say my cousin, uh, my cousin in San Francisco has said um, that if you've never had to have the Supreme Court decide who you could marry, uh, whether you're entitled to equal pay, um, what you can do with your body, that you live a privileged life. And it was a good perspective because you know, if you're gay, you're sitting there battling about equal pay and are you allowed to get married, not allowed to get married? Can you adopt, not adopt? Um, I mean, Loving v. Virginia had to decide whether or not there was going to be uh, interracial marriage permitted in Virginia. Uh, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. So it's, it's an interesting, if you want to try to figure out uh, whether or not you're privileged or who is not privileged and may need some additional support, it's the people who the Supreme Court's deciding what they can do with their lives and their bodies are the people who are not privileged. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I goofed up. This was actually the slide, I left the, the other slide in. This is a, a little bit of a, a easier to read statistic um, that the, I did have the total in here. Just in these massacres alone, um, between 1857 and 1932, to, uh, there were over 2,000 deaths recorded. There's, from 1932 on, I am sure there's a multitude of other, uh, uh, I would call them genocides against uh, minority communities in the United States. Um, the list that I looked at stopped here in 1932. Uh, perhaps it just got too horrific to continue going, or they're just not being recorded, but um, so then I went to a, uh, the Pew Research Center, uh, had some interesting uh, uh, stats. Uh, the link for the entire stat is at the end of the slide deck, but it was, I included these to kind of show a little bit of um, what perspectives are. Uh, and this was taken in, in 2019, so it was a year ago before George Floyd and, and, and uh, the recent events with the riots and protests. And, and if you look at the statistics in this, uh, of people who feel that uh, somebody's acted suspiciously towards them in some way, the only uh, instance where uh, subject, somebody's subject to slurs and jokes is the only one where it's, or second, second to only one, where it's not, uh, black individuals responded at the greatest rate. And, and for the slurs, it was Asians. Um, assume they were, and so, I mean, if you look at this, you know, white people are down at the bottom of the When we start getting into, you know, they assumed that they were racist or prejudiced, 
much less black people and Asian people are assumed to be racist or prejudiced than white people. So, I mean, this says something about where our society is in the United States right now. And I, I, do you want me to go forward with the slides or? Here's another statistic taken from the same report. Um, 84 to 87% of uh, black individuals polled felt that they were uh, treated less fairly than whites. Whereas only 60 to 61% for whites. Um, I don't know what the white statistics, white statistic is. I mean, do white people feel like they're treated less fairly than whites by police or maybe, oh no, I'm getting this wrong. Sorry about this. I'm losing my train of thought. Um, this is basically the, the white pe how many white people thought that black people were treated more unfairly by the police versus how many black people thought that black people were treated unfairly. So if you look at the statistic here across the country, the majority of the population thinks that the police treat blacks less fairly. Less whites do so than blacks, but I have a tendency to believe that some of this might be because communities uh, that are predominantly white uh, in more rural areas of the Midwest, uh, upstate New York, I mean, there's places that are more predominantly white than they are black. Uh, and it has a tendency to be more rural communities that they have less exposure to it. So when you have less exposure to something, it's like, oh, that's happening over there. I don't have any context for it. Um, but then if you start looking at the difference, I mean, I, want, I don't want to get political, but I thought this was kind of interesting that Democrats and Republicans, the difference between their view on how blacks in this country are treated. And I don't know the reason for the disparity I would assume that part of it has again to do with the fact that there's more Democrats in cities and, and metropolitan areas where there's a lot of interracial uh, communities than there are Republicans. I, I don't know. So do you guys have any comments on these? No, I'm just going to add in a, a great comment by Nadine Mazard who basically commented on from you, just to add in, um, Diane, thank you for, this is from Nadine. Diane, thank you for sharing your story of your mom. Also another good analogy is let's say one house is on fire. When the fire department comes to put out the fire, the fire department is coming to put out the fire and not going to focus on the house next door, not on the fire. Right. Thank you, Nadine. So that's, pretty much the end of the slides that I put together. There's some links here. Um, if you want to look further into where I got some of the resources, the DLA Piper and Eversheds links uh, focus on uh, global employment and basically what those two are, their lists of, uh, it has a list country by country of what's, what their discrimination laws are, what's legal and what's not legal. Um, I found it kind of interesting because most countries will say it's illegal to discriminate against people based on their race, religion, uh, sex, you know, and so forth. But yet, you know, some of the countries that have that listed as an employment discrimination, I was shocked and appalled because as a woman, you can't even walk in uncovered in some countries. <laughs> um, but it was, it's an interesting perspective on it. Um, the ILO is the International Labor Organization, and they have a pretty good, uh, uh, website uh, section on equality and discrimination. Um, and then there's the UN uh, Declaration on Human Rights that I referred to. Amnesty International, you just go to their website and it's everywhere. Uh, Human Rights Watch is another one that I looked at. Um, so that's, those are the references in case you want to do further, further research on an international level. Yeah, I would just add before we kind of open it up to any other questions. Uh, you know, Dr. Abram Kendi says the heartbeat of racism is denial and the heartbeat of anti-racism is confession. And I think that, you know, when you're looking at what is the difference between being quote unquote not racist or if you want to say non-discriminatory versus being anti-racist, uh, uh, someone who's actively uh, 
standing against and looking at the ways that their own uh, personal conduct, belief system, as well as to the extent that they use their voice and platform in their respective professional uh, positions uh, allow us to be interrupters towards the types of discriminatory and racist um, uh, conduct and, 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 and output that we see around us. And so, you know, when you're, when you're having a conversation uh, from a platform standpoint, and what I would encourage so many of our, our, our attendees, as well as I know what we're looking at doing internally within our own organizations is the difference between, you know, actually fighting issues of racism or discrimination or just talking about it is, uh, you, you know, I'd say in four points. One, we need to be able to identify the harm without being defensive. I think you kind of touched on that, Diane, about implicit versus explicit. So just recognize that there is uh, a direct output, a discriminatory output or harm uh, that certain groups are experiencing more than others. Uh, and get specific about the internal and external actions that you want to make uh, internally in an organization. So you saw in response to a lot of the George Floyd events, companies across the world were issuing these sorts of diversity statements that we're going to be better. We acknowledge that there's been ABCD wrong and we're going to take action to do, to be better citizens, better global citizens. But I think the importance is be generating statements that really turn to action, that these are the specific steps we're going to take when we look, for example, internally and we see a difference in promotion rates between women and men or between blacks and other groups. What are the intentional factors that we can be doing to really uh, close those gaps? And, and thirdly, dealing with the discomfort that's inherently involved when we're, we're kind of talking about uncomfortable conversations, but I, I've said it before, it's part of the yoga philosophy that I think you have to get comfortable being in uncomfortable positions to get the gains that you say you appreciate and value. And then lastly, I would just add, you know, the accountability factor is really what turns the difference. And that is what are you doing internally as an organization to implement uh, accountability to measure so that when you're measuring your success, you're able to, to really identify that success and then certainly celebrate it. Yeah, and, and a few things I would just add to that are uh, as individuals and for your own self growth and for the growth of your organization, be patient and forgive yourselves. A figure skater, the first time they get on their ice skates, falls down a million times and you're going to stumble and fall and you're going to say uh, things that are going to shock you and shock other people and uh, make you, you know, the hair on your arms stand up going, oh my God, I didn't mean it that way. So just say it though. You know, I mean, if you're, the, and be patient with the process because it's a matter of perspective. And the reason I wanted to present some of the global uh, perspectives was that in the United States, we look at it as predominantly a black and white issue. And it's, uh, you know, easy to identify a black person walking in the room, a white person walking in the room. It's so easy to identify and say, oh yeah, it's this or that. And it isn't this or that because as human beings, we've been pre-wired from back in caveman days to have fight or flight uh, mechanisms and instincts that if something is different than us, we perceive it as a threat. And so the only way you can overcome your lizard brain from having that instinct is to retrain your brain and educate it and open up and ask questions. Don't hide it. Don't keep it down in the bottom of your purse or in the back of the closet. Bring it out, ask questions, have conversations because it's the only way you're gonna to begin to get more comfortable. It's the only way we're gonna get uncomfortable and it's the only way we're gonna figure out how to get it all and pull it together, so. I, I, I think you kind of touched on something that we, we've I've definitely spoken with Ulrich about. It does take a level of grace from both sides yeah. uh, because there is the, the reaction uh, for folks to just be tired of having to constantly teach or explain how I want to be treated, you know, nicely uh, or as a human being. But at the same time, like you said, creating space so that folks can ask questions. Okay, do I call you African American? Do I call you Black? And you know, what does this mean to you? And I think being able to have uh, one, you know, that, that, that in the context of black white, that white folks are being intentional about doing research and learning, uh, taking ownership over that learning uh, experience, if you will, Googling, what does it look like to be an ally? Googling, 
all the research that you put together for this presentation, but then also walk in a relationship with other folks outside of you know the, the white community uh, that will help uh, folks to learn more about the various cultures and, and get a better appreciation about what it means, like I said, to be a good ally. Yeah. Absolutely. I think sometimes it, the problem for an individual, like all problems, can seem so big. And what I'm hearing you both saying now, which I absolutely agree with, is break it down into asking questions, Googling, how to be an ally, talking to people that you're close with and finding out about how, how actually it is helpful to discuss this issue from whatever race you may be and how it is not helpful, how we detract and how we add to Black Lives Matter, one step at a time. Um, it's easy to take the problem and just, it's so big that you, you almost become paralyzed, but that's what we don't want. We don't want paralyzed people. We want people who are walking slowly with this, but creating progress. Yeah, and sometimes- DL is, is the rail oh, sorry, the Diane. No, I was gonna say, and sometimes so, holding onto the rail on the side so they don't fall down so fast. <laughs> right, right. DL, have there been any interesting policies or discussions in the various organizations you work with and also within your company, that just in terms of, so what now, so what next, so moving moving forward, uh, just in terms of an organizational, on an organizational level, some practical, um, aspects that maybe we haven't discussed yet that you've you've dealt with or been involved in in the last while that you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, uh, structurally, there's been a lot of um, re-emphasis on the diversity initiatives that have been, that have been in place for the legal industry. And uh, the ABA Rule 113 was, was signed by over 117, I believe, companies that were uh, providing a, an affirmative statement to be more focused and intentional around uh, diversity. Uh, Mansfield rule, if you haven't heard of it, you should Google it and ask if your company is, is a signatory to it or implementing uh, their own internal policies, policies modeled after the rule, but it's an initiative to try and affect at least a 30% consideration of diverse uh, folks for hiring and uh, internal uh, promotion consideration and leadership. Uh, and you've seen even more recently, I think uh, the July iteration of, of Mansfield 4.0 included another 17 firms uh, and legal departments that are signing up to that initiative. Uh, again, several of those in, in, uh, in particular kind of modeling their own program, but it's an, again, kind of a reaction to what are we doing to be more anti-racist mm -hmm. and being proactive in advancing uh, diversity initiatives. And I think those are just important uh, to continue to do and continue to amplify because uh, doing so, I, I say you have to constantly exemplify the culture you want to see replicated throughout your organization. So when you say diversity is an important, uh, important to you, uh, not just from a dollars and cents standpoint, because the data is there that shows you have a more productive output by having a diverse group of folks working on a problem. Um, but when you say it's something that you care about, you do have to, to, to put the investments necessary, put the places, the procedures uh, in place internally from a systemic standpoint to really affect the change that you say you care about. And it's not just sufficient to just say, well, I'm not actively discriminated against ABC uh, person, but you have to be very proactive and intentional around the actions that you're taking. Mm, absolutely. Great, thank you. Just want to open up to questions for the last few minutes. If there are any still, please feel free to write them down. We'll take a look at those. Dan, in the meantime, I don't know if there are any last comments from you. I see we have three or four minutes left. No, are those questions that there's five questions in there, are those answered already? Okay, I think there's a new one that's just popped up, I think. Oh, here we go. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, here's, I'm just going to read this last comment by Nadine Mezard again. I'm grateful we are having this conversation as legal professionals avoid this topic and pretending that the movement is not happening and focus. It will take the white allies to make a change as our legal system is the biggest. Although I had my lifetime 
Although I had my lifetime work, happy to see that we can reimagine a different world. We need to demand change to see more black senior leadership and board of directors and make them more accountable. Also encourage change of politicians. Yeah, I'd say- the Thank you for that comment. Yeah, I, would just, I would just add, you know, and I think it's relevant to this conversation. We, we all are the sum of our individual voices. Something that I say uh, constantly here at the firm. And that means it doesn't really matter where you fall on the spectrum of uh, wokeness or awakeness to these issues. Uh, when we get involved and we lend our voice to the conversations that are around the dinner table or the emails that are exchanged or text messages that are shared, just as much as we lend our voice to the promotion or review table in our law firms and our businesses, uh, or to amplify the voices of, of those around us, women in particular, uh, attorneys of color, I think that that is doing something to affect change. And I think we can, I'll just share this briefly. I think we can look at recent events and get really discouraged. And I think you could look at even Diane's, you know, great historical backdrop of, of genocide uh, globally and certainly here in the US and get very discouraged. But, but I, I constantly say that the, the spectrum of progress is always on a pendulum. And we, are, we, we have these moments of regression but over the course of history, over the arc of history, as Dr. King and, and President Obama once said, we've seen significant progress. And that's something to continue to have hope for and to hold on to. And that the, the more that we speak together, the more that we share our respective voices, the more that we breathe together, as the name of this presentation is, then, then the better the world we're ultimately creating, the legacy we're going to live uh, leave for, for those to come. Yeah. And, and one last thing I'd say is that um, I know I've been guilty of this, is that if you're in a situation w in which you feel uncomfortable and not necessarily uncomfortable because people are making racist or sexist jokes or say, I mean, it's whatever situation where people are expecting you to work in a way in which isn't productive for you, uh, putting unreasonable demands on you, um, whatever the situation is. Uh, cr critiquing the way you dress because perhaps maybe you don't dress the same because you're from a different culture or have different styles. It's okay to speak up in a respectful manner and say, I'm not comfortable with the way this is going down. And I don't, I think that if people are able to find their voice in these, uh, and, and they're probably microaggressions in a, in a context, that if people find their voice to speak up on an individual basis, as situations arise, it will make people more aware as opposed to keeping quiet and thinking it's you. Because I know a lot of times I always thought, oh, it's me, you know, I'm not there. They're looking at me like I'm a little nutty because I just said something. And now I'm like, I don't care if you think I'm a nut or not. Like, I really don't care. You know, I'm going to say it because ultimately, if you're making me feel uncomfortable, you're, you're, you're silencing me and you're not getting my perspective. And whether my perspective is applicable or valuable in this particular situation. If you silence me, the next time when it is valuable, you might not hear it. So you're doing yourself and everybody else a disservice if you keep quiet yourself when those situations arise. So I say mm -hmm. speak up and listen. And then we can all breathe, to breathe together. Right. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Uh, our time has come to an end, but please drop us a mail or um, a comment if you do want to hear more discussions on this if you feel it's helpful and if you want to hear discussion of lawyers from different countries get in on this discussion and, and move forward with part two and three so thank you for listening in uh, we will send diane's presentation afterwards i think that will come through tiffany but thank you so much for being a part of this and stay safe during the corona pandemic which is still wreaking havoc everywhere stay safe everybody stay safe Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you again, Diane. Thanks, Thank guys. you, Diane.